Hello and welcome to episode 21 of Pixel Sift. Gianni here and once again I'm joined by my co-hosts Mitch and Scott. Hey hey. Hello. And boy do we have a cracker of a show for you today. Starting off we're going to be looking at tutorials and games. What makes a good tutorial and what makes them too tedious? What is it about how they teach you to play a game that makes it good or bad? One of the reasons that we were very happy to bring Level 1 from this room here in the State Library to our office is that our office is a space that we've put a lot of work into and it's an old house and it's, for me, having a space that feels like, you know, it feels kind of homely and inviting and accessible is really important. Yeah, that was an interview with um, Sophie, Louie and Kate from the Level 1 Co-op Working Space and they'll be telling us about their organisation and how they're helping Perth-based ga- ve- ah, <laughs> game developers uh, work stuff out. And uh, finally, we'll talk to the annual release double standard of video games. Why is it okay for some games to only have some minor changes year to year but others we accuse of repainting the same old thing? Good question, good <laughs> question. All that and more on episode 21 of Pixel Sift. You're listening to Pixel Some games, when they come out, are, you know, groundbreaking, very new, innovative. Some games are not. And there is a perception with some games when they come out, if they are a, a sort of the next chapter in a series or if they're the next kind of segment of a particular, you know, game franchise that when they bring out a new release, it's basically reprinting or repainting or reprinting the cartridges and, you know, redoing it completely again. But some game series, which do a very similar thing, are not accused of the same. Nintendo. Yeah, hence the double standard. Yeah. And we're just wondering why that might be and what is it in those games that we think, you know, this is innovative enough and something that is different enough, even though nominally it is number seven in a series it, or something like that. It's interesting that, like, um, the different approach we take to different properties. Like, the Call of Duty franchise is something that is accused of this often, and they seem to catch a lot of flack for just releasing the same thing every year. But, like, it... And then, but like with a few different guns and a few different maybe story elements. But then there are like, you know, the sports games or like FIFA, which I think personally have looked the same since I first saw one when I was 10. So, yeah. See, like um, with with sports games anyway, I would say like, say, yes, soccer or whatever. Like, you know, yearly you've got graphical updates as well as roster updates, you know, all the transfers that happen in the real life. Because it's a real life emulation, basically. So you want to keep up to date with the real life changes to the game. Which is, you know, an everyday thing. Um, and let's say with COD, uh, or for, let's just say first-person shooter, like type war, Sims, I guess, in general. Um, there's not a heavy amount of graphical updates. I mean, with COD, I think they've been using the same Quake 3 engine for, you know, a decade or so. Uh, I don't know if that's actually been updated for the new releases because I haven't sunk time into them because I don't really, haven't really liked them. Um, but, I mean, the, you, you buy them for the, the slight graphical update. Um, but you're mainly you're buying them for the maps, you're buying them for the guns, you're buying them for the you know new survival levels or whatever they've added into it. Like generally, the game doesn't change too much because people like it. You know, it's just uh, to give people what they want. It's really, I feel like it's just an alternative instead of uh, buying uh, you know say a huge update or like you know being part of a subscription update service. They just give you a new game every year or so. Um, I mean, in saying that. Like, I feel like COD's become a bit of a joke lately. Like, I, I stopped paying attention to that. Um, and this last one I really liked, I guess, was, like, Black Ops. But even before that, I mean, Modern Warfare was probably the last one where it was really kind of a different, a huge difference. Um, I mean, there's an, an argument as well made for, especially for a lot of these games, which are the annualized sort of releases, and they are pretty much bringing out the same version of the same thing. There is a big following for people who play those online and, and in multiplayer, and if you have a formula that works that's kind of been honed and fine-tuned throughout a number of patches and, and versions like that, you don't want to hugely change that because, you know, if you've got people who are, are good at the game and you go and change something that, you know, mixes it up completely, you go and alienate a fan base that is already, you know, pretty invested in your in your game. And maybe it is people who aren't as invested in this game who, who want to play games, you know, they might jump into the, the single-player campaign of a Call of Duty game and for them to see that 
being sort of rehashed, it's it's not so much of a you know a big difference. Maybe we don't see the subtleties of the differences. And and, and that's what- the, that's the problem with these kind of games. Um, you you're mainly they're catering for the loyal fans and for like you know the actual kind of the people that are playing it constantly. They will want that new release for yeah your blow ins that are kind of just playing it and maybe haven't played it for a few years. It might not seem overly different. But like say let's po- Pokemon. Essentially the same game for the last, you know, uh, almost 20 years now or whatever. 98 was blue and red, I think. Yeah. 20 but years tomorrow, <laughs> pretty not, much. Oh, wow. How topical. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's a collecting type game where the new release aims to provide the audience with, you know, new things to collect and catch them all sort yeah. of thing. Um, and the content is I added, think- kind of just adds into that, but the formula stays the same. And, yeah, exactly. And you were saying with Nintendo games earlier yeah, in the piece. So I guess ba- basically I think there's like a certain level of consumer, I guess, safety. I think that like people feel people feel that these properties won't really disappoint them because they haven't yet. And then so the companies capitalize on that by creating more of it. But are they playing it too safe? Yeah, or are Possibly, they ripping you off yeah. by doing that kind of thing? You know, just just really, that just sounds like cashing in. It uh, does. Yeah. But it, it is what the consumer, at the end of the day, wants. Yeah. I mean, they wouldn't do it if they, if they didn't sell every time. Nintendo is a really interesting example of this because they do just about every platform that they bring out, whether it's, you know, GameCube, uh, Wii, Wii U, they'll bring out a version of their flagship titles on each of those and there will be like you know there'll always be a Zelda game there'll always be a, a new Mario game there'll always be a new Mario Kart and there'll always be you know a new Smash Bros that's kind of the way it works and you know they do add and tweak little bits and pieces but you know they're the main games that people play and they're the sort of the flagship titles And I guess the confusing part is why is Nintendo often praised for this and then the Call of Duty franchise is demonized for it Mm. I think that that's the question that needs to be asked, and I'm actually not sure how to answer that. But yeah, <laughs> well, look, I don't have a problem with annual releases. Um, I more have a problem with the drive behind them. You know, like uh, some games don't call for prolific releases, whereas others, you know, and it, and it shows in the in the quality and enjoyment that people get out of the game. Um, like back to first person shooter, my favorite Battlefield was three. There's nothing intrinsically different, of, like compared to the other battlefields, or even since then. I just I liked the maps in that the best. I liked the guns. I liked the, everything. It was the package in that I thought was the best one that I'd played and enjoyed the most. We when we chatted to Nick McDonald um, on our last episode, he talked a bit about gamer entitlement and a, the sort of perception that people have a certain expectation of of particular games, and that voice can be very loud and very um, you know quite confronting. Mm. I mean, we have these people who who complain loudly about these particular things but maybe you know jane and joe blogs who who play the game and just happily play it are very happy with these particular things and it's the squeaky wheels who you know maybe don't represent the full picture of of the gaming populace it's also good to point out that the people that are complaining the most will be the first in line Mm. for the new one i find that's true (coughs) yeah yeah as they were talking about with the left 4 dead 2 boycott yeah exactly yeah they were the ones they knew that had joined the group also pre-ordered at a much greater rate exactly but this is that's playing into the obsessive hands i guess or like the pure pure fans i mean let's take it out of the gaming realm for a second and talk about iphones in comparison i was just thinking of that well yeah yeah, because you know people love them and line up like crazy for them and yep. I'm not not mixing words crazy people yep. go crazy over that and it's not because they're be- the best or whatever it's because they're marketed the best and mm. they're the most appealing and therefore like praised and sought after and probably you know there is a consistency in them as well you know that if you yeah. buy one it's going to be very similar to the previous one just ever so slightly better and yeah. that's a very similar sort of example for these and sort of that, games that's enough for a certain group of people yeah, sure. yeah. exactly if you want a reliability in what you're, you're doing I think it's it, yeah it's, it's something that we have to think about why you know why do we let some game companies and publishers get away with doing a very similar thing, but we are also very harsh on on other ones. You we know, do make it happen what's ourselves. The, what's the missing element that we're kind of missing between the? You know why does a Nintendo get away with doing you know Mario Kart up to seven now on mm-hmm. on thing, and then there's Mario Kart Wii U, which is versus you know Call of Duty Black Ops Three or whatever. You know, people you know jump on that, or even Assassin's Creed, which has dropped down from its yearly release cycle now to be every other year. So, but that spiked up quickly. So, Assassin's Creed Three was like the highest pre-ordered game for Ubisoft at the time. Yeah. So, you know, based on that, I can understand why they'd want to push a game out every year. But yeah. that, you know, they do reach critical mass at some point, quality-wise. Anyway, it's it's good to point out that Mario Kart's don't come out every year. 
That's, that's a thing, true. But, like, but they do come out every generation. That's true. Yeah. And they will be kind of, you know, it'll be evolving from the same sort of thing. We do use the term annually a bit loosely, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Some of those annual releases, some of them are just kind of prolific. Yeah, but maybe there's not a huge difference between that and the previous one. So, yep. I don't know. It's very, very... Uh, I guess it's very fascinating to explore the differences between uh, perceptions of these particular topics and whether we think that something like this is is good or bad. It's it's all in the eye of the beholder. Mm. Did you know Pixel Ziv is available on other platforms? You can find previous episodes on iTunes, Pocket Casts, YouTube, and on the Pixel Ziv website. If you're a budding game developer, it can be daunting to make the jump from part-time to full-time game development work. A new collaboration between SK Games and the Film and Television Institute aims to provide a venue for game developers to work together and learn from each other. We spoke to the team behind the new co-working space Level 1 and we asked them what a co-working space is and what it means for West Australian game makers. Well, co-working spaces um, have been around for maybe 10, 15 years. And what co-working spaces are, basically, if you're working as a freelancer or working in a small team and maybe you're working from home, it can get really isolating and you kind of lose all of the benefits of being in an office. So co-working allows people who are in those um, situations to come and work together and have the benefit of having other people around just to keep you sane, but also to um, act as a resource if you need help with something. Um, also, it, for if it's a, for a specific industry, which is what ours is, is for the games industry, it helps to uh, it shows kind of the vibrancy um, and it actually makes that that visible because otherwise you have people working at home. So it becomes a place where if someone's interested in investing or finding out more about the games industry, you can just point them and say, "Come and and come on this day and meet these people." And it's just this really great way of kind of showcasing what's happening and showing that things are are really starting to coalesce. Um, so I'm Kate Rain Scoldy. I run the Games and Interactive program at FTI. Um, I also co-run Level One with SK Games, and I am a game designer. I mix make mixed reality games. I've been doing that for about eight or nine years. Uh, I'm Louis uh, Louis Roots. I run SK Games. Um, I've been a developer previously. Uh, I think can still think I'm a developer. We mostly host parties, uh, exhibitions, showcase weird alt games and art stuff. Uh, we do this in Perth and around the country and actually around the world sometimes. I'm Sophie. I work alongside Lou to run the SK events and help make and create weird arcade controllers, which is super fun. And at the moment, focusing on our co-working space, which is level one. I really like games co-working spaces because it's sort of, seems like a more tangible thing to, to base a co-working space around. Yeah, so um, it's something that's definitely lacking in Perth and it's been talked about for a while. Um, we've just had an opportunity to kind of, you know, start trialling and pushing the idea f- further. Um, so that's how Level 1 kind of came about, really. It's, it's really important because they have spaces like this in Melbourne and, and other places where they have the game-focused ones and they've been really effective at helping the, the industry to grow. So we have co-working spaces here like Space Cubed, but they're for the startup scene and not for games and games folk and games um, developers have different needs than people in startup the startup world so we're able to cater to that by having a game specific co-working space um another thing to think about with co-working spaces um for game devs is that like it's really not funded very well in wa so you know a lot of the co-working spaces aren't affordable options um for game dev yeah so like we're trying to offer something that would yeah that can be accessible financially for people that just, you know, need that push to get out of their bedroom and work with other people and learn with other people. Yeah, that's a really good point. There's kind of a joke that going around about people eating tinned tomatoes for dinner. So when you're doing that, you can't really afford 250 a week for a desk at Space Cubed. So is the aim to kind of push the part-time or hobbyist game dev into the semi-pro or professional level? I'd say we wouldn't really know what to push, but, I mean, we want to... Opt, uh, I think people are a lot more willing to take the jump when they know that there is uh, places that will support them and other developers who are also doing the same thing. Um, if there was no kind of, you know, it's not like a safety net, it's just a group of people. It's like an AA meeting, but for, you know, people who want to quit regular jobs. Um, so, yeah, I think like having that, that network of 
physical people, like, you know, because um, online networks are great as well. Um, and that's a really big part of stuff like for a lot of developers, but I, I suppose that's not really, you know, we're, we're trying to get the physical side down and the, and the social side. You know, if you get this kind of like what's happened in Melbourne where you have one studio that's done really well, one or two, that can kind of bring everybody else up. So if we can start having that kind of success here as well, because as uh, Soph mentioned, we don't have um, we don't have state level funding from the government like they do in Victoria to fund our games here. So it's very difficult at the early stages when you can't get private investment and you can't sell your game yet or even do early access um, to get your game to that point. And you really have to sacrifice a lot. So that's where the government can really help out. And so our hope is that also that we can get government funding to make this more sustainable. Because right now this is it's running on kind of the generosity of, of SK who are donating the space. And that's the only reason we're able to, uh, to do it at such a low rate. But it's not sustainable long term. Can the WA games industry continue on if the funding stays at this level? Or are we going to see more of a brain drain to states like Victoria? We're already seeing that, the brain drain. We did a survey in 2014 and that was a huge issue is that we have we have people who are trained really well here and then they end up leaving because there's no jobs. And so we do have amazing talent here. I mean, SK Games is one of the examples of a great studio that's doing amazing things here and doing things not just creatively but supporting the, supporting the industry like with stuff like um, Level 1. But the... Um, the challenge you have is that people are leaving and we can't compete because we don't have the same resources. So it's not that stuff isn't happening here. It's not that we're prog- not progressing. It's just that it's going to take longer because we don't have the same kind of um, access to resources that can accelerate the studios like it has in, in Victoria. The arcade over in Melbourne is probably the most famous and successful gaming co-working space in Australia. Is the plan to work towards something like that for level one? Maybe Perth will find its own way and it'll be something completely different. Yeah, I mean, the arcade is great. Um, but yeah, obviously it's built around several different companies and I doubt we'll find the same scale anytime soon. But I suppose what I like about being part of it at this stage is being able to put our own kind of uh, emphasis on games as play and as non-commercial entities that um, that I don't see as much in the arcade. Our SK events and stuff sort of showcase that as hey you can make a game that's just good for a party and it'll be a good showcase of hey look this is just stuff that you can do over a weekend and then you can have a really fun party with like a lot of people and you can see people play your game and you know you can just enjoy the act of games without having to worry too much about the business side. But isn't that a good argument for more funding? We have funding available for films and TV which have certain local or cultural value that isn't necessarily commercial, is it disheartening that that sort of funding isn't available to games? It is incredibly disheartening, yes. All the time. I wish someone would give me some money. Well, it's an ongoing debate and discussion that we have where games are not considered art. So there's that really great example um, where there was the joint um, Screen Australia and CMF Canadian Media Fund for new innovative interactive pieces that basically defined what a game was and then said no games are allowed so you have that because games are not considered art by the powers that be and so you have that as an issue where even if you're creating games as art and not even doing it as a commercial thing it's still not going to be supported by art the arts funding because games are not art which blows my mind that's true that's true um i think what's interesting with the cross-pollination though is like um we we have experience in trying to get um grant funding for game related projects that I would deem art and it's like um, very frustrating as we mentioned but um, what's exciting is that people, more and more people approach us like artists or musicians approach us to work on projects with us and collaborate. So I think when there's artists and musicians approaching game developers, I, I think that says a lot about it probably being art. Level 1 will be having their launch event next week on Thursday, the 3rd of March. This launch includes tours from 10am to 4pm, so you can go down there and check it out. They're in West Perth. They're also having a small party um, at night, and that's starting at 5pm. It's free and it's open to the public, but you do need to RSVP online. So head over to level1.org.au. If you're interested in coming along, and we'll stick a link up to the RSVP page on the notes for this show on our site. Most of Pixel Sift will be down there as well, so you can come say hi mm-hmm. if you're checking it out. Pixel Sift! It's not Pixel Sift, it's 
Dr. Pixel Sift. Pixel Sift! Ta. Every time you play a game, you have to go through a learning curve. And when oh, I yeah. used to play games, there was a thick manual that you would read through for many hours beforehand, sometimes many hours afterwards, if you even weren't allowed to play the game, you would get in there and look, check out the manual. And that would be the main way that you'd learn how to play a game. As we've moved to more... Because you're old. Yeah. Wow. Well, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's That's a, that's a you know... A, a, anyway, manuals. <laughs> they used to be in games. <laughs> Heartbroken, just split. Um, yeah, basically now when you're in a game, they have to do most of the tra- training of your play style and the way that you learn how to play a game throughout gameplay in the game. And it's much simpler to sort of provide these opportunities for people to learn how to use particular aspects in a game rather than just throw, you know, a key map on the thing or a controller map on top of the, you know, the, the piece of paper called a manual uh, <laughs> where you would go from there. <laughs> well, so basically I think what, what makes a good tutorial is I think you need to make sure it's not text-based to start off with. Because I think text-based things in video games tend to be skipped pretty heavily by the gamer, so like they won't they won't note they won't take notice of it, and they won't learn the appropriate skills that need to be used later, and they won't have those tools to challenge like that to overcome those challenges. You don't want to put a book in front of them if they should be absolutely not mm. throw out the book. Yeah, yeah. Now look, there's different types of um, learners. You know, some people some people will work off different tutorials and stuff other people other people won't you know uh some people work off visuals um you know orally uh, uh kinetically even like so seeing hearing or even just motion um i mean there's also lo- learning by doing but that's kind of the point of tutorials to yeah. remove that completely yeah um you know no one likes tutorials even when you don't know what to do you still don't want to kind of be held back through the vague prompts and like you know Medial tasks, or menial tasks that they put you through. Um, For me, the old manual that you used to have with a game seemed to be much more like a throwback to the older style RPG games where people would play like Dungeons or Dragons or whatever, and you'd be like, okay, I have to flick through the book and find out what the particular rule is, and we go look it up like what's that. What's the procedure here? Yeah, what's the, hang on, what happens in this particular blah, blah, blah. You know, like that seems like more of a throwback, but now that we've got the ability with, you know, you know high-quality uh, video uh, and high-quality graphics we can put more of the user interface elements into the game and teach people as they go and and, you know have things pop up as they appear see that's the thing like we've raised up in quality and all the other things but you know tutorials are still pretty painful and they have been for quite a while like you know they're the first they're the first point of contact with the game and Mm. they can either kind of early on make it or break it for you i think i I wish if devs spent spent a little bit more time on kind of really making them uh I think More that, appealing. that trap is happens when a video game developer tends to develop a tutorial after the game is done. I feel like there's a constant thing. I mean, you can't do the tutorial for a game that hasn't been kind of, you know, properly made and, and you know, run through. Well, I think, I think when you developed it, when you develop a tutorial after a game is completely done, I think there's a danger with front-loading too much information onto the player, as in, like, you tell the player everything they need to know about the game, and suddenly, by the time they've got to the later part of the narrative and they won't know how to approach it because they were told something at the beginning of the game that they'll need now. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is a trap that they could fall into. Well, I think that's the trick with a good tutorial is that you set up a few of the basic rules of a game yep. and you teach them in a way that then if they come across something that they have to do that isn't been spelt out for them, they now have the ability to kind of you know, take their lessons and build yeah, from I, there. I, I like a little prompt, like for say that, you have your proper tutorial where like, you know, they stop you from doing things and they kind of ha- hold your hand through yeah. a few actions, you know. Wait until you jump over this little crevasse yeah, or well, whatever. A really good example of that, uh, a game that did it quite well was Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon. And it takes a little bit of a kinetic stab at the whole tutorial thing by like, you know, um, the, the guy you're actually controlling basically is annoyed by the fact that he has to keep doing this tutorial stuff because it's like it's <laughs> happening to him as well, which is, you know, great because it, it, li- it only goes for a couple of minutes and it kind of lightens that yeah. load of it being a pain in the ass. I think there's a difference as well between when you have a game where you start a game and then it's, you're given the option, have you played this before? Would you like to just jump in? And that's then that's quite cool. obviously a tutorial. But then you have other games, for example, like uh, games like Portal, for example, where people... You know, the first half of the game is basically a tutorial, but it's still fun to play through, even though you're still learning how to do the mechanics of the game. And Portal does something very well at the, the end of every Portal stage. There's at least a level of accomplishment, even from the very beginning, where you open the Portal and you get congratulated. It's like mm-hmm. I think you need to 
you can't just end, exit the tutorial and you've just learned the skills. You need to have felt like you progressed in the game somehow, and that really disguises the concept. Gain something from it, you know, get a weapon or whatever. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. You get incentive for doing your tutorials, basically. Well, it's... When you think about it, there's different types of games as well. So, for example, like a game like Portal, where a whole part of it is you're teaching someone to fish and then they learn how to fish at the end. You know, that's the whole point of the game. But then we've got other games where basically the instructions in the games are the game. So, say, for example, like G Guitar Hero or Rock Band, mm -hmm. where basically you're just following instructions the way through. That's true. And part of it is just following the instructions as correctly as possible. And you sort of that ramps up as well in difficulty as you go through, but... You know, the song at the beginning of the game is still going to be fundamentally the same as the song at the end of the game. You just need to do slightly more complex things. I think one of the best tutorial sequences I've experienced is probably the Borderlands 2 um, beginning. Like that whole starting sequence, even the HUD is introduced to you in steps. So like you go through, I think you've exposed to maybe your map first and then your health bar. And then as you move through, then you get your shield pretty much at the middle of it after you've learned how to deal with your health and your weapons and things like that. So I think it just it just gives it to you in small, understandable chunks. One that did it really well for me, uh, going back, uh, the original Metroid. It didn't have a tutorial, really. really. This is back in the you know, notebook days, but even then, not a huge amount. The thing that really set it apart, which made you realize that things were different, was that you started in the middle of the screen, like facing forwards. This is in the back in the day of, you know, your, um, uh, your left right side scrollers kind of thing so yeah. the fact that you were in the middle of the screen was like well i can go any direction yeah and you did you kind of went in any direction and, and as you go through like that a, doesn't sound like a huge thing now but at the time mm. it was you know you come across particular ways and the way that they do with lots of the metroid things is they kind of block off certain areas mm. in order to make you sort of funnel you down a path but they show something in there and they're like you can go in here but just but not the not way you think yet. you can just wait yeah. just wait come back once you've got the the rocket launcher or the something else <laughs> or, the or whatever yeah whatever come back through that way so Div Developers can also capitalize on like like the Metroid thing. Like uh, the first like a concept of the first person shooter is pretty. I guess they the gamers have affordances now that they have understood through years and years of gameplay. So you know what a side scroll is going to look like. You know what a first person shooter is going to look like. So developers can capitalize on that now. So it, that would that is one of the reasons why your book has not really appeared. Mm. In, like, oh, it's just and it's dwindled. also very yeah. cool when they take the rules that have been set up in the previous part of the game and then kind of twist them yeah. as well. So, you know, there's games, for example, like Undertale, which is a new game that's kind of come out, and it takes that sort of classic SNES-era RPG sort of game and everything you do in the game has an effect and everything you you know would normally do in a game, like, for example, it's an RPG, so normally you'd fight everything and you'd have to defeat every enemy, but in that, that has a concrete effect of what you've actually been doing. So, that you know, they've taken this rule and kind of switched it. And Braid is another example by Jonathan Blow as well. It starts out looking like it's a very simple sort of platformer, but as you go through the game, the mechanics kind of switch around and they just move in a pace that, you know, keeps it interesting and kind of changes the way that, you know, you play the game. On a note that games that I think do it poorly... Um, I've recently started playing Civilization for, I know, I know, I know, but the first time in a long time, you yeah. know, I haven't played forever and I'm no stranger to strategy games, but I thought I'd you know, do the right thing and do the tutorials and too narrow, too long. Like uh, I lost my steam and excitement of playing a strategy game so quickly and I didn't even play a real game. Ridiculous. Could have spent hours. Yeah, the, the, I should have just jumped in. Doing like, one I, more I, turn and then that's, yeah, that was I it. knew I should have just jumped in and just like dealt with it, but I didn't and it killed me. Well... We're all learning things, and now we're learning that this is the end of the episode. Yeah, so, for a podcast creation tutorial. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to post that later. Yeah, exactly right. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for another episode of Pixel Sift. We hope you've enjoyed the show. As usual, we'll be putting links up on our website, which is www.pixelsift.com.au. And Scott, if people are going on social media, where can they go to find us? Mm, people, you can find us on facebook.com forward slash pixel sift, twitter.com forward slash pixel sift, twitch.tv forward slash pixel sift, and youtube.com forward slash slash pixel sift au just and to mix it up a bit that's right just for a little bit of variety in there keep and you also, on your toes mitch uh, if people want to listen to our other episodes where should they be going yes yeah, so you can go to our website to stream the episodes or subscribe to us on itunes or pocket cast or use the rss link on our page and if you're on itunes give us a rating or a review uh maybe recommend us to a friend we really appreciate it It also helps us um do better at the show makes us more uh you know gives us more resources and it's always fantastic for people to have a listen and give us your feedback as well yeah Just my ego nice. could use a boost yeah, yeah get in touch we'd love to hear from you uh we've also got a steam group so jump on there as well seriously how do you join that mm. 
You have to teach a man to fish. Yeah. <laughs> Catch you later. I need a tutorial on Steam groups. Thank you.